Great, go ahead. My name is Tony Brown. Um, I'm a singer, guitarist, singer, songwriter, producer, artist, and uh, writer, graphic, graphic uh, image uh, creator. <laughs> um, I started playing professionally at the age of five. Uh, my main influence in playing was my mother and my grandfather, who was uh, on the Black Vaudeville circuit and also became a uh, grand exalted ruler of the Black Elks Club in Waterloo, Iowa. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, but because of some family difficulties between my mom and my dad, I ended up in my grandfather's house in Iowa. And um, she was a very talented young woman. She self-taught um, keyboardist, mainly vocalist as well. Um, she played drums, she played saxophone, she played bass. And uh, um, at one point, uh, the Elks Club decided to start having entertainment. So they had like the famous uh, black entertainments, Duke Ellington, Lionel Hampton, uh, Sarah Bond, Diana Washington, um, Nat King Cole, Ray Charles, um, and all the Chicago blues legends, all of them um, uh, played at the Elks Club because they had an auditorium which was a um, marching auditorium uh, for the Drum and Bugle Corps, but they converted into a concert hall on Friday and Saturday nights. And um, 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 so we, we grew up listening to all the black musicians that were great, who are legendary now, um, on, a week, on a weekly basis, every day and uh, every week. And there was always music in our house and there was always musicians in the family. Um, the secondary aspect of the family was athletics, of course, because that's how we could get to college. And So I was a football player and I played uh, from grade school until post-college and uh, tried out with the Kansas City Chiefs made the team, decided not to do a tried out with the Bears, made the team, decided to get into music and and uh, once I decided to make the full commitment to music after going through the educational system and um, not really enjoying it because it was the 60s and racism was uh, rampant at the time period and there was a lot of um, 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 inspiration with the aftertone of fatalism, meaning that people were inspired to do stuff, but then they were told that they never could do it. So it got to be a, a traditional thing that no matter what you want, if you want to be a fireman, and, and, and it was a cultural thing, but black people would tell her, like, oh, you'll never be a fireman, versus saying, kid, go and be a fireman. And so um, we, got, we got kind of confused as to what we were going to do and what we were going to make right. And I decided that it was going to be music, and um, I started playing, um, learning, relearning how to play an instrument. But I'd already always been a vocalist, and I started playing. Um, you know, I want to go back a little bit. As an early child, when I was, I was very, I was large for my age. So I sang with my cousin's band. They used to sneak me out of the second floor bathroom window at our house, and they, they'd have a, my suit and everything in the car. And, and they, they would put eyebrow pencil to make me kind of look. So if we went out of town, I could be on stage. But if we were ever in town, I had to stand behind the stage. I, I still dressed up, though. I still dressed up, but I was behind the stage. And I was back there singing. And, and you know, because I had to be careful because my relatives were out there. And they told my mom it would be like big trouble. And the money that I used to get paid, I would stick it in her clothing drawer some place where she wouldn't find it right away. And eventually she goes, oh, I hid this money a long time ago. And, yeah, and we just say, yeah, mama, yeah, you know. <laughs> and so she never got, except my cousin caught me going through the alley one night. So we had to make arrangements with my cousins. And I never got paid again after that. My mother got paid. <laughs> um, but um, I decided to start playing an instrument again and not just being a singer. And I started writing music. and. I joined up with, a, I played with a band in Iowa called IBTC, which um, was a very popular big band during the big band, uh, not the, like the Motown time periods with the horn section and two keyboard players and two guitar players and four black dudes up front dressed, dressed in beetle coats with doing steps, we, we did that. And then the band um, 
because of ego and personal problems, um, dissolved, except several of us stayed together and started writing music and doing original music. I, I hooked up with the bass player, his name was Doug Freeman, and we. Be, this was during the time period of Woodstock. So, um, <clears throat> we were playing in Milwaukee. We were coming up and doing duels for UWM and Marquette and, and uh, and, was this from, from Iowa City? Yeah, went okay. from Iowa City. And um, and uh, Father Crop, Groppy, Croppy, Croppy, Croppy was, we played at the Cloister House or the, the Hawkeye, one of the coffee house where they had a lot of the, the rallies and stuff. So we did a lot of rallies back then. And we eventually signed a production contact, contract with Dunwich Production in Chicago and um, became um, Involved with Ali Odo, Haynes, Jeremiah, Steve Goodman, John Prine, Corky Siegel, Siegel Schwab Blues Band, um, Jim Post, um, um, Linda, Linda, oh, anyway, Linda, I want to say her last name. Uh, you know the K? She was a, not, Col Bonnie Kolak, we were no, Bonnie Kolak. Um, and so we're, we're, we played a lot at the Fifth Peg and somebody else's trouble in the Earl of Old Town and, and um, um, we were in the Chicago circuit for a long time and, and um, we, we um, didn't get a contract so Doug kind of got discouraged and had some, he was, um, he, he had some physical problems so he had to move to a different climate, so he eventually moved to California, and I continued on, and um, um, I moved to Europe for a while, and Jamaica for a while, and I came back, and I decided, after coming to Wisconsin and Madison, and to come to um, Wisconsin and try to get with a band, and so, uh, first of all, I played solo around, I played Humboldt Gardens, well, it was Vic Cheater's place, the, the Cheetah Lounge. Yeah, what, what, tell me what year. <laughs> this year was uh, 70, 71. Uh, and um, where else did we play at back then? There were, God. Somebody else, no, no, uh, Why Not? The Why Not and Murray Tap and just any place we could play, get a, where, where solo players could play at. And um, I'm trying to remember how we met the Hound Dog Band. Met. I think it was Monaghan, Randy Monaghan. Um, we met and, and uh, we started jamming at the Hackett House, I think it was. And uh, Eventually, the band asked me if I wanted to sing with them, you know, and I said, sure, and we started rehearsing and hanging out together, and uh, the, the whole unit, and that's when I met the Ox Band and the Hound Dog Band, Short Stuff, and uh, what was the name, East Village was open back then, and, and um, Teddy's, I think it was, and all the, all the little places we played around, and um, we did the Hound Dog Band for a long time, and um, after I left that band, because I wanted, I wanted to play different, I wanted to diversify more. My whole thing at the time period of my life was trying to learn, play different styles of music and become good at it. And um, I wanted to try a different style of music and, and, and different applications to my music. I want to write more and do more original music. And I, I went back to doing solos. I played with a couple of bands that we put together that were completely solo bands in Milwaukee. Then I left Milwaukee because I joined up with a band called Preferred Stock. And uh, there they were playing like at Frenchie's Bulldog Pub. And they were doing more shows like they were do, uh, doing big uh, club shows where they were being held over for three weeks. We played at one club for seven months. So we played six nights a week for seven months. And that's one of the main reasons I joined the band was we could rehearse all day long and we play at night and we got play, paid really good. We got our, our, our room and board taken care of and we could play 
just about every cool popular song that was out there because that's what they wanted for dance and it was just the beginning of the disco that, that not really yeah kind of the disco the dance era you know where you had the Bee Gees doing the dance everybody was doing the dance thing platform shoes big afros you know and uh, um, so we were we we're playing 28 states 13 years 13 years straight solid and then uh, um, the band disbanded and uh, because of political we um, Clyde Davis who signed us to MGM Records um, got implicated in illegal contributions to Richard Nixon so all the bands who were signed with Clive Davis got dusted <laughs> basically they just took the drawers and said Bumpy well, doesn't work here anymore and boom we were gone that was our record contract and everything was gone and the, a lot of the band members got really discouraged didn't want to do it anymore and, uh, we formed another band uh, um, four piece power funk band and we toured with um, a lot with Luther Allison and a lot of Chicago blues bands. We opened shows for them and Canned Heat. And all this time period, I've been playing Summerfest. You know, I played Summerfest from the inception of Summerfest. And um, uh, when, when um, God, who was uh, booking Summerfest back? Charlie Payne. And Charlie Payne, uh, Henny Jordan was in charge, and Charlie um, and Alan Dahlberger had 1812 Overture, or what was the production company? Yeah, Daydream. Daydream, and they had um, Alan Dahlberger had his own uh, production company, and then they joined forces because at one point they were competition, and so Randy McElrath. Randy came in later. In fact, Randy initially worked for Charlie. Charlie. And then he, he, when Randy, Randy first became, uh, was involved with the production aspect of it, and then he went on to become the promoter. And um, um, so we're talking the 70s to the mid 70s. Um, I moved back to Iowa and then I moved back to Europe and then I moved back to the United States. Short story long, I mean long story short. And I performed in Europe. Um, uh, I had a recording deal with a German label called Grammophonics and I did a couple releases there. Came back to the United States and I started working as a, a Tony Brown and, and we're doing more R&B, more and, more dance, R&B, traditional R&B style. And um, I got a call one day from Corky Siegel and he asked me if I wanted to do a show again at Summerfest with singing a couple of songs at Summerfest. And I said, yeah, I want to do the gig. And he says, well, and I said, well, who are we playing with? Says, well, we're opening for the Jackson Five. And I'm like, okay, we're opening for the Jackson Five. So what am I going to do? He says, well, I just want you to do the three songs that we, we usually do when you set in with us. And so I was just like, it was just a gig I was going to get paid for. To, just a gig I was going to get paid for. Tell you, no, you're opening, there's 300,000 people, and they knocked down the back gate of Summerfest, and, and they, they bum rushed us. So all of a sudden, it went from 3,000 to like, bleh. And they, there was nothing the police could do. There was, the back fence was gone. It was just, so everybody was standing out there looking over the fence. We're part of the audience now. So when we, and I come on stage and I had never been in front of that many people in my life that I couldn't see the end of it. I looked out and I knew then that it wasn't just the singing, it wasn't the being presented on stage, it was the power of music that you could say something that someone would listen to in a certain method of mute, combination of rhythm and word and then meeting on top of it that could be significant. And soon after that, Corky recorded um, his first Siegel Schwal kind of disperse and Corky started doing his own um, CD and he did his first CD on a, I mean, record and uh, he asked me to come into Chicago to record on it. And um, 
I went into Chicago and we did the session and basically it was a, a schedule for a three day session. He got it done in about two hours. So he paid me what he was going to pay me for the three days. And he said, me and my friend were there. And he goes, you guys want to go see a concert tonight? And we're like, yeah. I go, well, who is it? Said, it's just some band from Jamaica. You know, and I said, well, what, they, what kind of stuff they do? And I grew up in Calypso because my dad's side of the family was from the Caribbean. And so I grew up, I grew up singing Calypso and knowing island and Afro beat before it was considered Afro. But it was just part of, you know, we go home, we sing these songs, and it was just like that. But I never thought anything of it because in my environment, it wasn't separate from any all the other musics. Although I never heard anybody doing it. You know, other than Harry, Harry Belafonte and some uh, Grand Exuma and people from, and Mighty Sparrow, you know, but they didn't tour in the United States. You never got to see them. So he said, there's this band from Jamaica called Bob Marley and the Whalers. And I'm just, uh, and, and we had just started playing reggae, just um, went back to put together a four piece a, acoustic band complete acoustic, and the instrumentation was a kunga player, a harmonica singer, <laughs> a acoustic bass player played guitar and, and who sang as well, and I played guitar and sang as well, and it was called Tony Brown Band. And we recorded with Tom Gress uh, here in Water Street Records, Sigmund Snowpeck was on the label, there was a couple of Milwaukee artists on the label, so this was 70, 73, 74. So a whole lot happened between 70 and 73, 74. It was like several, I mean, a lot of bands, a lot of different recording projects, a lot of different musical influences came through. And um, it, was part, it was part of making this meal. But we had all these ingredients, but none of it made any sense. But, so we continued on in time. And uh, we recorded, um, first one was called Jersey and it was on Water Street Records and then the German company I worked with before called Grammy Phonics picked it up and it, it, it was it went in Europe for a while and then we did uh, two um, we did oh first one was called Flock of Stones and that was just me solo and uh, um, then the second one we did was Jersey, and that was with the four-piece band. And then we did another one, which was called um, Song of Celebration, which got, a, got some press. It, it, it jarred some doors, it knocked some doors. And so we started, we, we worked, um, what was Variety in Minneapolis picked the band up. Uh, Bobby Ingalls, who managed, uh, was a CEO of Variety, they, they picked us up. and. Uh, so we toured all over the United States, and that group disbanded, and we decided that, that the reason why we couldn't get any gigs was because we were acoustic and people wouldn't hire us. Even though we played dance music, it didn't, there was no drummer, and the bass was acoustic, and, and the bands were taking our gigs from us. But the gigs that we did have were making more money per musician than most bands were because it was all acoustic and it was very easy to travel. It was just simple to travel. And so we went back to Madison, moved to Madison, and uh, I formed the first Tony Brown band. And then uh, 1976, um, we played the International Rhythm, International Music Festival in Ultra Reels, Jamaica with Bob Marley and the Wheelers and Justin Hines and a, a lot of different reggae because I switched over and started doing a lot of reggae, but I did reggae R&B, which Jamaicans didn't like and the black people in the United States didn't like. Only the white college students liked it. But the white college students were paying us money to come and rock the houses. So we were playing all over, just everywhere. Um, we were on tour after tour after tour, and we're doing, we we're playing probably 158 dates a year for, from 77 until the 90s. <laughs> so, um, and, and when, in 1982, we, I released uh, the first international nationally acclaimed 
CD first that I did was called Prisoners in Paradise, which uh, was rated number four, released by Playboy Downbeat Magazine. It got four stars in uh, Playboy and Downbeat Magazine. Uh, we toured and we, we opened for just about anybody and everybody you can name. Um, uh, we did uh, 38 states in the United States, five provinces of Canada, Mexico, Caribbean. We didn't do Europe though. We're per per pretty much, and and so from that point on, uh, this is this is a very definite point in my life because fame became fame happened before honor, infamy happened before compassion. I didn't. I had so much personal consciousness that I didn't have any personal consciousness. I was so much into me that I didn't know that I was sent here to do this presentation. And the presentation was to keep myself, well, not getting ahead of myself. This was a time period when I learned that being selfish served its purpose. But it usually, the selfish person usually ends up alone. <laughs> That's the the, the, less, the great lesson, the great lesson. And it, I still, it took me, you know, I had, to, I had to beat my head against a brick wall for several years and look really stupid and look vain and kind of turn into an asshole kind of person and not know it because I was so, it was, I was in such a cool environment, you know, and people were going, oh, you're really good, oh, dude, hey, dude, you know, and, and I was making money and, um, in the meantime, while I was experiencing that life, I, I lost my marriage and my kids and the physical things that I had and um, went into a depression. But it was a um, seduced, um, induced, drug-induced, uh, comatose, high-activity, brilliant, successful time period. So you put all that together and it's just a weird cocktail. and. Um, I ended up going back to Jamaica and seeing poverty for the first time. I mean, seeing somebody who died outside their shack, just didn't make it home. I and mean, it was just like, you know, I could see a cat get run over by something, an animal left on the street. It was like that. And I came back and it was like, Man, I'm kind of messed up. And um, at this point, I decided I shouldn't be performing in front of people because I'm not using my power right. And uh, so I just, I kind of kept playing a lot, but then I started focusing more on the music business and booking. And I got, um, so in the 92, uh, time period 1990 well let's go back yes like 1992 I, I solicited um, employment from five different venues and managed their entertainment and that in turn got me involved with a lot of different bands and I wanted to learn how to help these people make their careers work but I didn't want to be a booking agent I didn't want to be a manager I just wanted to help people get on stage and make people feel good and make good music in the studio and have songs that made sense. So I started doing a development and direction more or less. And that went on to the, such a point that I started meeting people in the industry and started soliciting contract deals and management deals and booking deals for other people. That continued uh, until I went, the company went um, international in 98 and we started representing European Caribbean, uh, Central American artists. We attended Medom, Popcom, all the major marketplaces for selling music. And we were attempting to sell music. And I was still trying to promote myself. And I, in the meantime, still turning out albums, of, but not touring as much. I was just more about the music. And that continued until I got really lost in so many people in their life that I said I had to leave. And I was living in Madison at the time. So I left Madison and I moved to Door County. And it was just tranquil. It was just beautiful. And, and I get calls every once in a while. I went out on tour with Taj again. I went out on tour with Ziggy Marley. I went out on tour with Jimmy Cliff, with Burning Spear, 
Uh, I did the third world band, United States, Canadian, European, Africa tour. Um, just on it, Squeeze, I went out with Squeeze. <laughs> uh, Richard Thompson, uh, Mimi Farina, uh, just Bonnie Raitt, John Lee Hooker, just it became that I was doing more concerts. I was, I was doing 170,000 flight miles a year. So it was like, that's, that's a huge commitment. I had an apartment in Boulder and I was at, I had an apartment for, I eventually I had to move to Boulder because I was playing so much in Colorado that I had to move to Boulder. And um, uh, I had an apartment that I had for two years and I stayed there for three months. I paid for it for two years, but I was only there for three months. And everything just got all jumbled. And I came back to Door County, into Wisconsin. And one day I woke up and I called all my friends and I said, you guys have to pack up all my stuff, I'm leaving. And I packed up all my stuff I needed and I left and went to Belize. <laughs> and uh, two days after, some days after I got there, I was working, rebuilding a restaurant. Two months later, I got a job managing a 500 seat venue on, in Ambergris Key on, in, in San Pedro. It's the number one venue in the Caribbean. And uh, I ended up doing that for eight years and playing five nights a week and recording two more CDs. <laughs> At the time, CDs. We convert it now from LP to CD now. And I, I come back to the United States and do a tour once a year and go to Europe and do a tour once a year and then go back to Belize and manage this facility. And um, I work for two millionaires and a billionaire. And uh, they decided that they, they, they saw what I did. And they had seen me do it enough that they now could do it. So they asked me to take a 50% decrease in my salary. And uh, but no, there was no barter, no, there was, that was it. <laughs> We're not asking, will you? We're saying, here's what we're gonna do. So two days later, I was in Cancun, and a week later, I was back in the United States in Iowa City, Iowa. And it's a, it's a circular story. Yes, back, back, in, Iowa City. back in Iowa City now. And uh, two granddaughters. My son-in-law is a very well-established blues vocalist, songwriter, musician in Iowa. My daughter is just pure gorgeous. and. My three sons, I thank God I came back because otherwise they'd probably be dead, at least two of them, because they were just going down a dead man's road, I caught it. Everybody wanted to hit you with a stick, even the fleas. Everything wanted to hit you bad, you know? So I came back to, and it was, the, I, I think a spiritual directive brought me back home to find myself so I could become, again, what I should have been 40 years ago, <laughs> which was number one, clean and committed to doing what I'm doing as a representation of a spiritual basis versus a vanity, ego base. These gifts were given to me to use, not to abuse. And so um, I became more into a spiritual side of my life, uh, studying Buddhism and, uh, and uh, a vast and deep or study of history and the history of human beings and the understanding of emotions and how to use the power of music to convey the blessing. And uh, then I get a, a email from some guy, I don't know who he was, he said, we're thinking about getting the Hound Dog Band back together. And, and it was just like there was angels sent with that message. It was just because the things we, we all have our difficulties with the past. But the past is where it is and it should stay there. It shouldn't become a part of the future. And, and when that happened, I just, the one thing I remember was all the smiles and all the hugs and all the good times we had. I remember we had bad times, but I didn't think about that. And um, my, that, that little guy inside you that, you know, he's got razors and guns and bombs and he's a little terrorist inside your head. He's always trying to get you to go that way versus to think of the hugs, the smiles, the good people you knew and, and just like us here, you know. Um, God, we had some really good times together and if we would have learned the value of those good times, in some ways I think if everybody 
would have learned to bet in those time periods, the world would be a different place. So um, it just really, um, 1982, I got inducted into the Iowa, uh, no, 2002. I got inducted into the Iowa Music Hall of Fame. And in 2008, uh, the band I played with, the big R&B show band, I got getting inducted into the Iowa Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then um, in 2010, I got an honorable uh, position, honor, position of honor in the uh, uh, Reggae Hall of Fame in Europe. And uh, of course, the, the awards in Wisconsin, the Whammy Awards, and Best of Wisconsin, and Best of Iowa, Best of Minnesota, uh, Midwest Vocalist uh, Award in uh, 88 or 89. So I got all these accolades, and I just, you know, at that point in my life, I was, I didn't know, I didn't. It was like something big. It's like somebody giving you a stone and you don't know if it's a diamond or if it's real or not. And so you, you, you treat it like it's real until somebody says, man, where'd you get that piece of glass? Or, or they said, man, you should get that thing checked out. But the ignorance, ignorance sometimes is the greatest fatality of intelligence because you will retain ignorance because intelligence sometimes is too much to deal with. So you, matter, you, you, you will stay with ignorance because that intelligence will make you see too much, you'll be too responsible. So a lot of time of my life was spent that way, denying the, the, the forward motion. And when the Hound Dog Band happened, um, um, it was stigmatated. It, was, it had a little dot in it. And then once that we clicked, the, 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 the clock, it was going, And once it went poof, once you heard that sound, you just get goosebumps. <laughs> you can feel it in you, and you know it. Oh God! And then you know. Then, and uh, to take it all into a summation, it was, it is for me a culmination, a culmination of bringing the blessing forward. Because now we can do that. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's, it's really an inspirational story. Yeah. I, you know, in, in my own sort of musical wanderings, I, I still say that the greatest show I ever I ever saw was Bob Marley and the Whalers at Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. in New York. It was just, you know, the, 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 it was such a magical evening. You know, I mean, it's, it's that enormous venue and the audience. I mean, I've been to a thousand shows at Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. from the old days. And the audience for that show was just, it was young people, it yeah. was grandmas, yeah. it was families, you know, it was all races. I mean, New York, yeah. you know, it's white, black, Puerto Rican, Dominican, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was like everybody was there. And as soon as he walked on the stage, everybody stood up. It was well, like one. That what I say it is? And I, I, at one point in my life, I would never say this. I would think it and I would believe it, but I would never say it. When the presence of God is in the room, whatever that may be, it is a great force, and it tends to make everybody feel good. <laughs> it tends to make everybody feel solidarity, feel oneness, everything is forgotten. It's like you've been, all your clothes have been turned away just for that moment, that, that rush goes through your body. Um, on the European tour with Bob Marley and the Whalers, there were eight shows and one, I think the smallest one was 120,000. But we were, we were at a show in Italy and it was 484, 5,000 people in a soccer stadium. Now there's two shows that really blew me away in my life. Not the, the, the Jackson 5, not the Jackson 5. To come into to get off a tour bus after arri arriving into a strange country where I spoke Spanish to people who speak Italian and we understood each other perfectly. <laughs> Number one, you know, it was like I was speaking Spanish and everybody was, yeah, I'm right over here. <laughs> it was just hilarious. And then we get off the tour bus and that's as far as the tour bus can go. So then they put you in a little car and they drive you to the, the, 
the backstage accommodations where there were RV type home type things. And I would say every six inches of earth within a 20 mile radius was covered by human feet. Well, it's like Woodstock. That's like Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, and, and he, he couldn't even show himself because the whole, the, the whole crowd would erupt. It was just, he would walk out and it was just like, it wasn't just yelling, it was like continuous sound. It was just, Wah! and he walked out and the crowd actually drowned out the PA. It was, and, and then the, the next one, real briefly, was um, uh, we got a show in, in, in Nigeria. And uh, it was, uh, the, we wanted to go out and see where the, the show was going to be conducted at. And we got there and it was an empty field. It was just an empty field of, it was an empty field. There was nothing there. It was a flat, empty field. There was, that was it. And there were some military guys milling around and stuff. And so we like, oh, shoot, what's this, you know? And we go back to the hotel. We come back, That's, this is 8 o'clock in the morning. We come back at 3 o'clock, there's fences, there's stage, there's lights, there's, there's huge generators that came from the mines. They had these great big semi-truck generators. And, and, there were, and the way that we saw the, the, the place the concert was, there was it was like a, a, something was on fire because it was dust. It wasn't dust. It was all these thousands of people walking to the concert ground. It was just, you know, they show you how the antelope in Africa run across the plain. It was just, it was just too much. It was way too much. And then the, uh, the I met a lieutenant colonel from the military, and he took care of me. But that was, those are my two biggest shows. But right. well, thank you, thank yeah. you, Tony, for for doing this. It's a it's, it's wonderful to get all everybody back.